seminar. We have Dr. Frederick McCormick from Cambria National Lab here as uh, our guest speaker today. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. McCormick uh, received studies everywhere. He received his uh, BS from uh, Washington, uh, University of Washington, his master from Georgia Institute of Technology, and his PhD from Harold Watt University in Edinburgh. He also worked in many places. Uh, he worked at AT&T Bell Labs, uh, a small uh, startup uh, called Call and Recall Incorporated, and at MCOR. And in mid-2003, he joined Sandia National Lab. He's now the manager of uh, the Applied Photonics Microsystem Department, which uh, pursues applied research in silicon photonics, nanophotonics, biophotonics, and computational sensing. And he has published over 80 publications, including book, four books and uh, four book chapters, <laughs> and 16 patents. And he's now here with us, with us today to speak about uh, photonics micro, microsystem uh, at Sandia National Labs. So, Thanks for coming. Oh, well, thanks very much for, uh, for having me up. And again, thanks for, uh, for organizing uh, this and uh, the other meetings that I, that I have. And thank you all for coming uh, to, to here. Um, so I will, I will talk uh, uh, a little bit about uh, Sandia in general. Uh, perhaps some of you aren't uh, too familiar when I, when I go to different places. A lot of folks aren't aware of uh, all the different things that happen at Sandia. And uh, as I'm always looking for good postdocs and good staff, uh, I, I want to advertise a little bit. And then I'll talk about uh, some examples of, uh, of things that, uh, that my group, and uh, in collaboration with other folks in the Microsystems Center at Sandia, are, uh, are working on in the, in the nanophotonics and uh, nanoelectromagnetics area. Uh, just to acknowledge uh, uh, the, the main contributors, um, so I, I manage a group of uh, 17 or 18 folks. We work uh, extensively with folks in other groups that, uh, that focus on fabrication issues or uh, focus on uh, uh, MEMS design issues or, or other things. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we collaborate extensively within Sandia and, and also uh, uh, with various universities. Um, in the photonic crystal area, these are the main folks that, uh, uh, that have developed that area. We also, you'll, you'll hear a little bit about some of our phononic crystal work. Uh, Jim Fleming uh, led both of these. He's unfortunately not with us anymore. He died a couple of years ago. But he, uh, if you search the literature, Jim was very pro prolific and uh, largely responsible for both of spinning up both of these areas at Sandia. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the plasmonics work, uh, some of the uh, metamaterials work uh, that we've been doing in the terahertz region, and, and then uh, work that we're doing now in the infrared region and uh, close with a discussion of some of the silicon photonics work that we're doing. So Sandia um, began its, uh, its life as part of the Manhattan Project. It was the Z division of the Manhattan Project, uh, basically having responsibility for all uh, non-nuclear parts of a nuclear weapon. Uh, so the, the parts that uh, make sure that it doesn't go off before it's supposed to go off and makes, does go off when it's supposed to go off. And, how do you transport it and uh, those kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, it has about 8,500 staff. As you can see, they're largely in uh, electrical engineering uh, and mechanical engineering, but we have uh, quite a few physicists and uh, computer scientists and quite a broad range of, uh, of all the disciplines. It's actually quite nice uh, when I left Bell Labs, one of the things I missed was being able to walk down the, the hallway and, and find an expert or somebody who'd written a textbook in almost any area you could want. Um, at Sandia, there's a similarity. If I need a, uh, someone who uh, knows about neurology, I can actually find someone who, uh, who uh, is a, a neurologist or a, a biophysicist to have lunch with. So. Uh, there's still a large nuclear weapons portion, but there's a lot of other things going on at Sandia. 
Um, about 60% of the business now it deals with things other than uh, nuclear weapons sorts of work. Um, I always like to show this picture because I'm trying to figure out some way to get assigned to Kauai. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, this is the Albuquerque facility. It's the largest facility. Um, there's a facility that has about 1,200 to 1,500 folks in Livermore. Uh, performing kind of the same uh, non-nuclear weapon portion of, uh, of work for Lawrence Livermore. Um, and then there's uh, uh, other, other places that, that uh, deal with manufacturing of, uh, of some weapons components, uh, as well as uh, Yucca Mountain, which was uh, explored and characterized uh, for uh, storage of nuclear waste. So I'll, I'll kind of pop through these different mission areas uh, at Sandia uh, to give you some idea of, of the different areas that are, that are going on. Um, many of these divisions are, uh, are fairly uh, applied. So these are sort of systems engineering divisions. The last one I'll get to is the science and technology division, and that's the division that I'm in that's a, a bit more research oriented. So within nuclear weapons, there's, there are things that are uh, associated with uh, with designing and building uh, these weapons. There's also uh, uh, things that I didn't fully appreciate before coming to Sandia, and some of the work uh, in this area uh, that's not so hardware related is related to the fact that they can't test these uh, weapons anymore. And so they've spent a lot of money on supercomputing and modeling and simulation. So these are extremely high fidelity models that uh, uh, model multi-physics uh, from uh, high explosives going off to the nuclear reactions to uh, degradation of uh, components and things as they sit in the ground for 40 or 50 years. Um, there's also uh, interesting test that goes along to uh, validate these models. So one of, the, uh, one of the areas within the science and technology division is this, uh, is this Z-pinch reactor or pulsed power. It's uh, the most powerful x-ray source in the world right now that essentially compresses uh, something less than a giga amp into uh, 10 nanoseconds. Uh, and uh, by injecting this into, uh, into a, a, a little coil, you can uh, vaporize a coil, you can get uh, compression, you can essentially do uh, very controlled nuclear physics reactions. It's actually the most efficient fusion reactor in the world right now. Uh, in terms of wall plug efficiency, which if those of you who follow fusion reactors, um, that's not real efficient, but, uh, <laughs> but they, uh, they do apparently hold a record. Um, and then there's uh, other large scale testing where they, uh, they wanna know what happens if, uh, if you were transporting one of these weapons and it got into a wreck with a fuel tanker and you had a big fire. They have to be absolutely sure that it, it won't go off. Um, and you know that's not something that they can actually test and, and burn one up. So they, uh, they have uh, among the highest fidelity fire models in the world. And then out in the desert around Sandia, they have big pools where they can light big fires and spectroscopically analyze them and make sure that the fire models are reflecting reality. So interesting, very large scale testing. Uh, a friend of mine runs that facility and he just did a test that I found uh, very interesting, where they had a 200 meter large pool of water that they dumped some ungodly amount of uh, liquid natural gas in. And apparently the test was uh, for, uh, uh, for establishing the standoff distance for first responders for uh, fuel tanker crashes. Because a big tanker with uh, liquid natural gas could uh, leak in San Francisco Harbor and the, uh, the, the tugboats or whoever who go to respond need to know, can they stand off 20 meters? You know, what's the dangerous level? And uh, so they, they, they set a whole bunch of gas on fire and measured the uh, e emissivity of a gas fire on water, which apparently had never been done before. Uh, that gives you some idea of, uh, of those kinds of things. Another area that Sandia does is uh, our uh, support for different government agencies. Um, and this is uh, pretty wide ranging uh, from, from doing uh, things like uh, synthetic aperture radar. So uh, 
I think the best uh, SAR imagery uh, in the world is being done by this group at Sandia now. Um, and they've miniaturized these systems to fly on UAVs. Uh, there are some uh, interesting sensor systems that are, that are made by uh, various groups uh, at Sandia. There's a large robotics uh, group. A friend of mine uh, builds robots uh, that take uh, shells apart. So apparently the world is, uh, is swimming in 155 millimeter uh, artillery shells. Uh, a lot of which are very old and no longer used. Instead of blowing them up, they actually like to recycle them. Uh, but apparently they don't get a lot of people volunteering for the job of uh, recycling them. So they build, uh, uh, he builds these robots that take them apart and dump out the high explosive and, uh, and do other things with uh, chemical uh, weaponry too, apparently. Um, apparently Sandia has launched more uh, rockets than NASA, uh, and I think it's part of this program where they, they actually make targets for, uh, for ballistic missile defense, uh, and so they launch those. Uh, my cousin was actually the uh, payload engineer for return to flight on the shuttle, and uh, I didn't know Sandia was involved in that uh, until, uh, it's actually, I guess, this picture. Um, until I went to a family reunion and he learned I worked at Sandia and said, well, you know, are you guys going to deliver uh, this, uh, this sensor? It's a sensor that sat on the end of the arm and it's basically a flash LADAR, a, a, a small scale flash LADAR uh, system that uh, was used to look at the tiles to be sure that they could actually re-enter and avoid a, a Challenger-like problem. Uh, anyway, so a variety of uh, interesting stuff going on by those guys. And, and again, these are folks that uh, their focus more is on delivering these sort of advanced uh, systems. Um, there's also a large area, several thousand people that work in this energy uh, resources and nonproliferation. So in this area, uh, there are uh, folks looking at uh, the, how uh, fossil fuels are shipped around. Uh, there's a group now, actually one of my guys uh, in my group, which is, struck me as very strange to begin with, but he's, he's working on a project where they're looking at, uh, at how do you re-engineer the grid to support all the alternative energy that's coming online. Right now you have very centralized uh, production of energy and you don't really have a whole lot of, uh, of uh, distributed computing in the electrical grid uh, when when that changes to very distributed energy production model, it actually has to become kind of a smart computerized network. And uh, this, this guy in my group spun up uh, uh, a uh, optical networking company during the dot-com dot boom. So uh, apparently he got called in because he knows networks. Um, there's also work going on in non-proliferation. So uh, one of the things that Sandia does is it launches sensors that uh, attempt uh, to detect uh, nuclear detonations, so unauthorized testing. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, and then there's Homeland Security and Defense. If you go to an airport and you uh, walk through one of those uh, sniffers, that's uh, ion mobility spectrometry that uh, was developed at Sandia or, or miniaturized um, at Sandia uh, for detecting explosives residue and, and other stuff, I guess. Um, there's folks that are looking at, uh, again, security or robustness of uh, things like the, the grid or the telecommunications network, uh, as well as uh, um, security of energy supply. And then they build some special sensors for, uh, for other security applications. So finally, we get to, uh, to my area, which also has some cool stuff. Um, this is the uh, Science, Technology, and Engineering Division. And there are... Uh, these main capabilities, uh, you're probably familiar with the high performance computing capability, um, which uh, I guess it was, it's been several years since, uh, since they held the top rank in the top 100, but Red Storm for six months or whatever was the fastest uh, computer. And actually the guys uh, that did that design will claim that it's still the fastest running real codes on real problems. Although, that, to me, that sounds kind of like a software guy talking. Uh, um, another strategic capability is in microsystems. 
uh, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, about that center because that's my center. Uh, a lot of work going on in nanotechnology and then these extreme environments capture uh, some of the things I was talking about earlier. So big fires, big explosions, uh, big things crashing together. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the foundations or the topics that really support these capabilities are in computer science materials, uh, microelectronics, and uh, micro and nano photonics. Uh, engineering science is sort of these big software uh, tools. So there's a center of about uh, probably five or 600 people that just write these enormous multi-scale multi-physics codes uh, that, that run on uh, tens of thousands of processors. Uh, and then bio and pulse power is this uh, Z-machine -mach fusion reactor I spoke of. Okay, so that's Sandia writ large. Um, if we drill down a little bit, uh, the microsystem center is part of uh, this MESA facility, which uh, is a nice acronym for New Mexico, I guess. Um, this is one of the largest investments by the DOE at Sandia uh, to basically co-locate our silicon fab with our compound, our 3.5 compound semiconductor fab. So these used to be separated by about two miles and re required a lot of hiking back and forth uh, between uh, different folks. They're now in, uh, in basically the same uh, uh, extended building uh, that's about, oh, probably three or 400 meters long uh, that houses the class one uh, silicon clean room and a class 10, class 100, uh, three, five compound semiconductor fab. And then they built us a nice new building that has uh, uh, lab space to, uh, to play with all the stuff that comes out of the fabs. And I'll, I'll talk about some of those things. Uh, it's co-located uh, on the same general campus with a uh, facility that houses uh, uh, not necessarily the supercomputers, but the, uh, the folks that run the supercomputers. So we have a lot of modeling in there. And then uh, a lot of uh, the system folks, they wanted to mix in with the, uh, with the research folks. So they built them a building and, uh, and then they kind of shuffled the deck and put people all over the place so that we'll get to know each other and, uh, and hopefully transfer some of the advanced technology into these systems more quickly. But it's kind of nice. When I first came to Sandia five years ago, <coughs> I spent uh, uh, almost two years in a trailer that was uh, placed there, I think, like in the 1930s is my impression. It may not have been that quite that old. but. Uh, and I was told, well, welcome to you know, a government job. Um, so I was very happy uh, after recruiting people and bringing them in and they'd come into the trailer and say, gee, do I really wanna work here? Uh, now we have this nice shiny building and uh, it's a little easier. Um, so we drill in a little bit more into the uh, Mesa fab facilities. This is uh, this microelectronics development lab, uh, silicon fab uh, constructed in the mid 90s. Uh, it was largely built to, uh, to build microelectronics for uh, these nuclear weapon systems and satellites and uh, things that uh, must withstand fairly harsh radiation environments. So lots of effort put into uh, what's called the RAD-hard CMOS by process. Um, so there's two, sort of two ways that you can make something radiation hardened. Uh, one is you, uh, you play with the materials and the stack ups of different materials such that ionizing radiation doesn't cause a lot of trap charge in, uh, in bad places, you know, near the gates of FETs and things. Um, another approach is uh, called rad hard by design where you simply replicate the critical functionality and then have, uh, have things vote. So that way, it's uh, statistically liable to work even in, a, uh, even in a radiation environment, up to some level. Um, the, uh, the, the rad hard by process design doesn't scale to uh, extremely fine line widths. So if you get down to uh, very fine line widths and low voltages, um, boy, very slight amounts of charge, even single events of, uh, of charge can uh, upset uh, the, can exceed the, uh, the voltage margins. And, and so things that have to work in, uh, or things that absolutely positively have to work or have to work in very uh, high radiation environments use this red hard by process. 
government has a, a number of those kinds of applications, so they maintain this facility. Fortunately, uh, that's not a high volume business. So uh, this facility is kind of unique in terms of uh, CMOS fabs in that it, uh, it ships product. And so uh, there are, you know, with a typical product, there are a lot of reliability constraints. Um, yield and reliability are actually tied together. And so, uh, so you need to have a, a well-run production fab in order to meet those requirements. So uh, all the tools are under statistical process control and there's computer tracking of all the lots and the steps and everything. Um, but typically in those environments, you don't get to play. Uh, a typical fab manager, once they're yielding, uh, you, you know, the, the researchers, they don't allow PhDs within 50 meters of the fab usually. Uh, so uh, this is a little bit different and actually has uh, PhDs and master's folks on the tools. And they get to play a lot. Uh, so this, this ship's rad hard microelectronics. Um, Sandia has probably the most complicated MEMS process. Uh, I think well, they licensed it to uh, Fairchild, uh, a five layer process, but they routinely make uh, MEMS with seven or nine or, or even more structural layers. And these are where the, the funny pictures of these very complicated Swiss watch gear uh, constructions come out of. Um, Additionally, uh, we've, we've used this fab to make silicon photonics, and I'll talk uh, about uh, some of that work. The photonic crystal work uh, is done in this fab, as well as uh, microfluidics, uh, the uh, ion trap foundry for uh, quantum computing with, uh, with ions is, uh, comes out of Sandia. There's work, a uh, large project going on now to bake uh, silicon qubits for quantum information processing. So lots of wacky stuff done on the silicon side. Compound semiconductor side uh, is also quite a substantial facility. Uh, some of the initial vertical cavity laser uh, demonstration was done there. And uh, whereas this is a silicon facility, and so you have uh, silicon and it's associated the CMOS dielectrics available, a few metals, and that's pretty much all the materials you can play with. Well, we have germanium in there now, but uh, there's not a lot of uh, material variety. On this side of the house, the gloves are really off. Uh, and so pretty much, uh, I think there are six or seven MOCVD reactors and uh, four or five MBE reactors. And there's pretty much anything grown uh, except uh, compositional materials like Mercad telluride. So uh, anything from uh, ultraviolet gallium nitride sorts of materials up to uh, I think some of the longest uh, or longest wavelength quantum dot materials. Uh, I think they're growing quantum dots uh, that uh, uh, have PL at four and a half microns or something. Um, so uh, some RF electronics, high powered uh, transistors, uh, terahertz lasers and QCLs are made there. There was a project working on uh, terahertz transceivers so heterodyne receivers as well as the lasers. Um, strange super lattice, uh, long wavelength focal plane arrays. There's also a capability to do uh, LIGA or uh, deep X-ray uh, lithography. Um, and then uh, we do some metamaterials and plasmonics and I'll give you some examples of that. This is just sort of a, a few examples of uh, the different optics things that are made there. Um, I mentioned the photonic crystals and silicon photonics. Uh, there's some uh, germanium uh, APDs, avalanche photodiodes and single photon uh, avalanche detectors, as well as uh, apparently I'm seeing from some of our quantum folks, you can use similar structures to do ion detection um, or single ion detectors. Uh, there's a, a, a fairly large group of ex uh, UC Santa Barbara folks that are making photonic integrated circuits in gallium arsenide and indium phosphide. Um, there's also uh, a capability in diamond turning and a lot of uh, e-beam lithography capability. So lots of uh, diffractive and sub-wavelength uh, optics as well as uh, some novel micro-optics. Uh, this, is, this is a diamond turned uh, element done in kind of a unique way with a, uh, uh, a non-spherical mill, kind of like an overhead mill on a diamond turning mill, which is a little bit weird. Um, 
way to do diamond turning. Uh, optical MEMS, this is a kind of an interesting uh, structure uh, that's made via surface micromachining, but this mirror array, the mirrors have uh, 27 microns of stroke, which, uh, if you're familiar with optical MEMS, is kind of an astonishingly large amount of stroke. And then metamaterials plasmonics, and I'll, I'll mention more about that. One last thing uh, is a, a facility called the Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies. A, a few years ago, DOE spun up um, five of these centers uh, in different sorts of areas. Some of them are uh, focused more towards bio applications and things. The, the uh, center uh, here in, in New Mexico actually is kind of unique in that it combines a facility at uh, Sandia with uh, a somewhat smaller facility at Los Alamos. And the main thing there is to uh, uh, push nanotechnology more towards platforms. So they're trying to integrate um, different uh, scientific areas of, uh, in nanotechnology to, uh, to sort of raise the technology readiness level uh, or uh, bring it uh, more into practice. This uh, facility actually has, uh, well, they're, well, they're doing work in nanophotonics, in uh, nanoelectronics, in uh, some bio things, and then sort of theoretical work at the nanoscale. Um, twice a year, there's a call for proposals. Um, and uh, before the professors in the room get excited about uh, uh, potential funding, they don't actually provide any funding. What they provide is access to this facility. Uh, which is quite a substantial facility in terms of uh, nanofabrication capabilities as well as uh, nano characterization. So there's, uh, again, lots of E-beam, uh, uh, electron beam microscopy, there's uh, STM or SEMs and uh, TEM capability. Uh, there's a lot of nanofab and nano testing uh, capability in, in these two facilities. And if, you, uh, if your proposal is accepted, you basically get access to all of that for free. Now, you still have to send a student or somebody to do the work, they get to, but you essentially get uh, someone to run the tools or a sent scientist to work alongside the student for free. So, pretty good deal. Uh, and the website's there if, uh, if you want to learn more. Okay, so... Uh, by the way, feel free to interrupt me if you have a specific question, if I touch on something that you're interested in. That's, uh, so that's the God and motherhood of Sandia. Um, I will uh, touch on uh, a, a few of the, uh, uh, of the uh, projects that are going on in my group or associated with my group. Um, and I'll start with photonic crystals. So Sandia's been working on photonic crystals for hmm, upwards of 10 years now. Uh, the, uh, the main uh, thrust of this work has really been on, on uh, full band gap 3D photonic crystals. So 2D photonic crystals in suspended membranes have been pretty well explored. Uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, this area you have to make those holes extremely well in order to uh, uh, limit the out-of-plane radiation and the losses and things. Um, so most of the work that we've been doing is concentrated on uh, 3D photonic crystal structures uh, that uh, have somewhat better control of, uh, of some of the characteristics. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the initial work was done uh, using a, a damascene process. So it's basically a uh, well, I'll discuss it a little bit more later. It's a layer-by-layer -layer process that uh, allows you to build up uh, very complex structures. And we've explored most of the uh, published uh, structures using this technique. It, it basically leverages a lot of the, the uh, technology developed for MEMS. That's led to uh, uh, being able to fabricate quite large areas. Uh, a lot of the work in photonic crystals are uh, millimeter sorts of areas. Uh, we routinely fabricate stuff on 6-H wafers, and if you stitch reticles together, you can get uh, nice large areas. Uh, it's done in a CMOS fab, so it's not incredibly cheap doing it this way, but it's very reproducible and, and high precision. Um, and those of you that are familiar with photonic crystals <coughs> will know something about, uh, about why we're interested. They allow you to do very high energy confinement. Um, you can build things that have... Uh, 
quite broad uh, optical characteristics in terms of angle and spectral response. I'll show some data on the unique absorption and emission characteristics. Um, there are these super prism effects as well as uh, anomalous light propagation effects that can be engineered in, uh, in photonic crystals. Um, <clears throat> we uh, have explored a variety of different applications uh, at, uh, at several different levels. Um, with this engineered reflectivity and transmission, you can make some interesting filters. So if, if you have needs to have filter characteristics that are extremely broad in, in spectral or angular range, this is one approach to doing that. Uh, energy production and energy harvesting is something that Sandy is quite interested in, and, and there's been several projects looking at thermophotovoltaic micropower. And in this case, it's the selective e emission properties of photonic crystals that are interesting. Uh, we have a project where we're looking at an infrared projector, so testing uh, infrared seekers and missiles or, uh, or infrared uh, focal plane arrays. They need a projector, uh, and it turns out uh, if you can engineer the spectral bands, you can, uh, uh, you can create an RB, RGB sort of projector uh, in these longer wavelength uh, regions. Uh, you can apply the, uh, these photonic crystals to structural health monitoring, so very small changes in the, uh, uh, in the uh, topology can uh, create fairly large uh, response in terms of the, the spectrum of the reflectivity or the absorption. Uh, and then you can uh, potentially use these structures to do passive thermal control. So um, let me see. In this uh, thermal photovoltaic approach, <clears throat> for those of you that aren't, aren't familiar, you basically have a long wavelength photovoltaic cell uh, that you uh, uh, illuminate with a selective emitter. So something is hot, it has a, a black body spectrum in the infrared, uh, you can build these PV cells so they go out to almost two microns of detection and you can catch the tail end of that uh, black body spectrum. If you can engineer the emitter so that it only emits below two microns, well then you're going to have a more efficient collection system. Uh, and that's really the, uh, the, uh, uh, the thrust of this. So there was a project that actually in a, in a very small package had a uh, very long-lived, uh, fairly uh, decent amount of power production system using this. Uh, it turns out by correctly engineering these structures, you can also cause the energy to be directed, uh, and that makes these sorts of systems more efficient too. Um, I guess the last application is within the, uh, the near field of uh, these kinds of structures, uh, you're essentially engineering the uh, the density of the optical states, the available optical states. Um, if you put uh, interesting materials, nonlinear materials or, or uh, gain media in there, their, uh, their characteristics are modified. So if you put uh, quantum dots into these, you can change the uh, photoluminescence spectra and the, uh, the potentially the gain that you can extract. So there's interest in in looking at uh, making laser media as well as uh, more efficient solar cells and those kinds of things using these structures. Uh, some data. This just shows the uh, broad angular response uh, across 40, 40, almost 40 degrees. We don't see uh, much shift in the band edge or the, uh, the uh, overall reflection response. Uh, this is a metal photonic crystal structure, so you get a very long uh, long wavelength edge. Uh, by changing the uh, dimensionality or the spacing between, say, these logs and this log pile structure, you can uh, move the emission peaks uh, or the absorption peaks around quite a broad, broad range. And an interesting thing about these uh, emission peaks is that they're non-Weenian. They're, uh, they're pinned as a function of temperature instead of shifting with temperature uh, like a typical black body peak would. Um, the, uh, ah, so the, the process that, uh, that a lot of the early work was uh, w used to, to demonstrate these is this damascene process. It's basically using the back end of line processes in the, uh, in the CMOS fab. So these are the same sort of processes that are used for MEMS production. Um, what's uh, fun somewhat unique is uh, the ability to do extremely thick layers of uh, extremely stressy materials. So 
people who are familiar with uh, fabrication uh, will probably wince if they see 50 microns and tungsten in the same sentence. Uh, it's typically potato chips wafers and, uh, and, uh, and then when, uh, when it's released, the things go sprawling and uh, scatter about the fab. Uh, because of a lot of experience in, in chemical mechanical polishing and annealing techniques, they've been able to come up with processes that, uh, that allow them to put down many, many layers of tungsten to get these large thicknesses and keep the wafers flat and not have them, uh, not have them uh, fall apart once the, uh, once the oxide is removed. <clears throat> Um, we've looked at other approaches uh, to, uh, to making these 3D nanostructures, and this is, uh, this is one that's, uh, that's matured relatively nicely. I also like to put it up because it's a good example of a, of a fruitful university collaboration. Now, this was with John Rogers' group at Illinois, and uh, he, he demonstrated uh, he was one of the places that it has been looking at uh, interference lithography uh, done with, uh, uh, with diffractive masks. So this is getting to be relatively popular now. There's probably six or seven groups around the world that are exploring this. The basic idea is in instead of setting up an optical bench and bringing in lots of different beams to interfere and create a, essentially a hologram uh, that would be subsequently developed to create a uh, fine structure in a photoresist, uh, you can set up a phase mask that will produce diffracted beams and, and do this in a uh, sort of a contact approach, a near field approach. Um, he had, his group had demonstrated some uh, millimeter, several millimeter sized areas and, and basically we worked uh, with him to scale it up to a, a larger uh, uh, process that uh, was a, a bit more robust and put some modeling around it to do some predictive uh, calculation. Part of the problem is if you have a given structure that you want to create, uh, you need to know what, the, what does the mask need to look like for uh, uh, a given uh, wavelength of illumination and collimation of the wavelength of the light and exposure characteristics of the photoresist and, and things like that. Uh, but this work proceeded over three years and, it, and it's resulted in a relatively robust process um, where a variety of different uh, structures can be fabricated by back calculating what the required mask is and then exposure either on a, uh, a mask aligner with a filtered source or with a laser source. What are the functions of structures? Um, well, a variety actually. Uh, so this is, I think this was one of the first demonstrations of a, uh, a direct large area exposure or creation of a Penrose quasi-crystal, which has some nice, uh, in terms of photonic band gaps, this is a path to getting more uh, isotropic performance out of uh, photonic crystal response, um, as well as being theoretically of great interest to uh, modelers, I guess. Um, some of these other uh, structures are of interest for, uh, for their incredibly high surface area. So uh, we have folks that are looking at how do you make better batteries. Um, so high surface area electrodes are of interest at the end of this project, we had a collaboration with a, a group in the biology at UNM at University of New Mexico that uh, wanted specific scaffolds for doing uh, tissue culture growth. Uh, so a variety of different stuff, especially since you can make, uh, well, it makes it in a polymer. Um, there are some issues with shrinkage and things that we had to address, but uh, the polymers are nice for biological interaction and then uh, we have a variety of techniques using atomic layer deposition where we can put dielectrics uh, into the structure or coat the, the structure to make it dielectric or coat it with metals to make uh, it metal. Um, and I think, yeah, so there's some, uh, there's some results here. These are basically results of uh, correlation between uh, <coughs> simulations that predict for a given phase mask what the, uh, what the resultant structure will look like uh, in, uh, in a plane parallel to the surface of the wafer and then throughout the thickness of the wafer. Uh, and, uh, and then they're comparing them to the final result. Um, and overall, uh, the matches are pretty good. I mean, we're getting up towards 90% pattern match, uh, which is a, a pretty good metric. 
This is a result of, uh, of a photonic crystal design where uh, the photoresist was first coated in the dielectric uh, because the metal deposition processes are relatively high temperature. So if you went directly to metal, you'd essentially melt the polymer uh, and you wouldn't get a coating if you create a scaffold of a high temperature dielectric. Uh, and this deposition can be done at low temperature. Then you can actually uh, either use CVD or ALD to coat it with silicon or metals. And then with the metals, you get the high index, uh, refractive index break that's necessary to, uh, to get a nice band gap form. I guess the last thing that's of interest is, uh, <clears throat> so the photoresist has a nice nonlinearity that gives you these separated planes uh, in, uh, and sharpens up the structure. Uh, if you want more nonlinearity, you can use two photon absorption. Gives you a, another quadratic term to knob to twist. Uh, Sandia is kind of unique because that, uh, that fusion reactor that I talked about earlier, they actually want to take pictures of the, uh, of the implosion. Uh, and to do that, they use uh, a femtosecond laser as a, as a strobe light. Uh, and it's a big, big femtosecond laser. Uh, it takes up probably half of this building. Uh, so they, it's a terawatt, and they actually have a petawatt facility. A friend of mine runs that, and I was happy to find that he can put down a, over a gigawatt per square centimeter over an entire six-inch wafer. Um, so it's, uh, they're, they're actually doing some experiments to, uh, to do two-photon exposures. Although I, apparently if there's a fine line between exposure and uh, evaporation, so uh, they're still working on that. Um, just some, some work uh, by using E-beam approaches and some interesting material uh, uh, experiments. They managed to demonstrate photonic crystals in the visible. Uh, this, I think this is the shortest wavelength demonstration that wasn't done with self-assembly techniques. So there's some uh, sedimentation in, with uh, microspheres and things that have achieved uh, visible performance. But I think this is the, the uh, shortest wavelength layer by layer approach. Okay. Um, we extended some of this work to see could this be applied to phononic crystals, and indeed, uh, indeed it, uh, it could. Um, if, you, if you engineer the Mie scattering as well as the Bragg scattering, you can uh, create band gaps just like you do with light. And it turns out that uh, tungsten, silica, silicon, air, these are all nice materials with pretty dramatic uh, velocity of sound. Um, so I, I came back from a photonic crystal workshop where someone mentioned this, and I asked uh, my guys, this should be quite straightforward, right? You have all the models and the fab. We should be able to jump right on this. And it turns out that uh, the speed of sound in uh, materials is a six-dimensional tensor, not a scalar vector or a scalar refractive index. So the models took a little longer to bring on, online. but. Uh, they have uh, come online and they work fairly well. Um, this, is, uh, this is quite nice because the same kind of feature sizes in the microns to tens of microns give you phononic band gaps in this frequency range that's of great interest for RF signal processing. So some of the first devices that we're making here are high Q filters and high order filters for RF signal processing. Um, if you scale it up to even higher frequencies, it's a very nice tool for looking at how phonons interact with materials. Uh, just some results. Uh, the models are getting to, to match the experiments better and better. Um, one of the issues that you see with uh, these kind of structures is the sound will bounce back and forth and bounce off of things that you don't want it to bounce off of. And so you get a, quite a bit of, uh, of other artifacts happening that you have to kind of uh, identify what they're coming from. But uh, we're able to create band gaps. Uh, I think this is a simulation result, but uh, with these structures, it looks like we can get cues on the order of 10 to the fourth, which for uh, mechanical effects is a pretty high cue. Um, we have another project that's kind of looking further out at uh, ultra high frequency phonon manipulation. So if you get into terahertz phonons, you can start to think about manipulating the thermal photon, phonon uh, spectra. If you can do things uh, like that, then uh, you can start thinking about engineering the heat capacity of materials 
or, uh, or uh, shielding Johnson noise. So these are kind of science fiction now, but uh, very interesting science fiction. Okay, let's shift gears and talk uh, about some plasmonics and metamaterials. Um, plasmonics, as you probably know, are electron density waves uh, that happen at optical frequencies. Um, and kind of nice, interesting way of enhancing electric field. Um, <clears throat> you can get uh, uh, enhanced nonlinear effects that are useful in biosensing. Uh, there's also this extraordinary transmission and novel emission effects that you can do with plasmonic engineering. Similarly, with uh, metamaterials, where you can artificially engineer the permittivity and the permeability, you can do many of these same things, as well as uh, these applications that have gotten a lot of press recently. Um, one uh, experiment that we have going on in plasmonics is to build uh, the optical analog to uh, uh, frequency selective surfaces, which is, are quite well explored in, uh, in microwaves. Um, if, you, if you scale things down, you can essentially take a, a single layer of uh, metal dielectric interface and make anti-reflection coatings, essentially. Uh, and these anti-reflection coatings can perform over fairly impressive uh, uh, angular and spectral bands, which uh, for a single layer is kind of a, a magical effect, I think. Um, so there's a project that's looking at, uh, at doing this at infrared frequencies, and the initial results are, are really quite good, that uh, uh, you can bring, this, these structures are fabricated on gallium arsenide substrates, because we have a lot of those lying around and they work well in the uh, E-beam system. Um, but uh, you can lower the reflectivity down to the residual substrate reflectivity uh, quite substantially, and considering this is made out of gold, uh, it's quite, a, quite an interesting result. Um, apparently, the codes for modeling this uh, are fairly challenging, surprisingly, uh, for such a simple structure. But getting the codes to converge for this uh, was quite a challenge. Um, we also do work in uh, uh, basically applying these effects to chem biosensing. So one project is looking at uh, anomalous transmission or extraordinary transmission through nanohole arrays. There's a few groups around the world that are looking at this. And by engineering uh, <coughs> the, uh, these nanohole arrays and then functionalizing them, you can change the dielectric environment around the holes and change the, uh, the transmission. Uh, the, this extraordinary transmission effect, um, in a nutshell, is that if you look at the area occupied by these holes, you might have, uh, uh, from a purely geometric analysis, a transmission of 5%. If you illuminate this thing appropriately, you can get transmissions that, uh, you know, that go up to 40%. How is this happening? You're exciting plasmons, and they run down through the hole, and they re-emit. Um, and it's extraordinary. Um, if, you, uh, if you functionalize this and then uh, attach the appropriate uh, uh, biologic species, it, it can dramatically affect the, uh, the transmission and shift the resonance, and so uh, it makes an interesting sensor and perhaps one that you can integrate in a very small package. Uh, similarly, you can use uh, plasmonic effects to increase the electric field dramatically uh, in uh, small areas, and this can cause uh, your Raman signature to, uh, to be as great or even greater than uh, fluorescence signatures. And given that Raman signatures are a lot more discriminating than fluorescence signatures, there's a lot of interest in biosensing. Okay, uh, metamaterials. Uh, we've had a fairly extensive program in terahertz metamaterials for the past few years, um, looking at biosensing with metamaterials, pretty much the same approach as, uh, as I just discussed. There are high field regions that you can functionalize. If you, uh, if you bond uh, to them, you can shift the spectral response. Um, we're also making uh, metamaterials on very thin substrates that you can then stack or you could put into uh, very small regions, so uh, intravascularly or into, uh, into very small tubes. Um, there's also been work at looking at uh, the polarization response of these metamaterials. So, Terahertz, in general, is suffering from a lack of optics. Uh, you know, you can buy lenses and beam splitters and polarizers and modulators for 
certainly uh, visible near infrared and, and infrared uh, wavelengths. These poor terahertz optics guys, you know, they, they don't have much. Um, so uh, we're, our terahertz groups are actually now using these metamaterially designed uh, components to do uh, selective polarization, beam splitting, and different things. And, uh, and recently, uh, there's been work on terahertz modulators. So I think there's a paper that's just come out that uh, details uh, the first uh, terahertz spatial light modulator. It's 25 pixels or something, but it works pretty well. Okay, we, we just started a few months ago a large program in, uh, in infrared uh, metamaterials. And uh, it's basically focusing on these three things. Uh, the first is uh, low loss or engineered loss. Okay, I should start accelerating, I think. Um, we're trying to, to control the loss mechanisms in metamaterials. Um, the other aspect is uh, we're interested in real 3D metamaterials, not just uh, metafilms, um, so many layers. And we're working in the infrared. Uh, there's theory and modeling going on uh, that's, uh, again, looking at our high performance computing environment. So we're trying to do uh, very high fidelity uh, designs. Uh, the material science aspects are looking at dielectrics instead of metals as well as composites and metals still. Uh, and then uh, we're using a variety of uh, fabrication techniques and building some, uh, some very novel metrology to measure both amplitude and phase. Uh, the work's just started, uh, but there was uh, essentially a scaling of one of our terahertz designs that was fabricated and, uh, and measured. And actually, some of the measurements are, are novel. It's, I think it's the first time that uh, some scatterometry has been done on these films. Okay, the last thing uh, that I'll blow through quickly are, are some of our silicon photonics projects. Most of uh, this work uh, is basically a scaled version of WDM networks, so wavelength division multiplex networks. As part of a DARPA program, we worked on uh, putting optical interconnects on highly multi-core processors. So the idea here is you have a CW laser source that has lots of different wavelengths, you send it onto the chip and then you have filters or you have waveguides that send all of these, these different wavelengths down and, and filters that pick off individual wavelengths that individual cores can modulate, put back on the bus and talk to other cores. Um, why would you want to do that? Uh, it turns out that if you want to talk uh, within a chip, it costs you about a picojoule per bit uh, to go say 100 microns. If you go between chips, it's on the order of 10 picojoules per bit. And if you look at the physics underlying optical interconnect, uh, the energy requirements are dramatically uh, lower. So uh, you can go on a chip or between chips, perhaps as low as a femtojoule per bit. And uh, because of the crosstalk issues and things, you can also put more channels closer together. So pretty substantial improvements in the power dissipation, which is the biggest uh, problem with uh, high performance processors now, as well as interconnect density. So we are working with our uh, high performance computing folks. They want to build an exascale processor. If you look at Red Storm uh, that has uh, 13,000 nodes, they're, they're putting four processors per node now. Um, this thing uses something on the order of five megawatts of power, uh, not counting the air conditioning. So you can probably double that. Um, if you look at what an exascale uh, processor would take, you know, you need a small nuclear power plant. Uh, and this is why Google and Yahoo are hosting their data centers next to uh, large rivers. Um, slow, slowly flowing rivers now, I think. Um, another project we have is to use uh, this sort of interconnect to pull data off of very large focal plane arrays. So folks want to do persistent uh, staring uh, focal planes that have hundreds of megapixels at high frame rates. You get terabits per second. And if you bring a fiber in, you, can, uh, you, you don't have thermal conductance out of the cryostat and those kinds of things. So what do you need to do that? Um, you need low loss waveguides. Uh, we have uh, exhibited quite low loss in uh, silicon as well as in silicon nitride. Uh, the loss is the biggest, con 
biggest effect that limits uh, achieving high Qs, and this is the easiest way to measure very low loss. So these sorts of numbers, uh, this is, you can get this in industry, uh, but I think this is a, a world record for loss in silicon. Um, you need to make filters. This is pretty well established for a lot of years. You can stack up these micro rings to make high order filters or bandpass filters. Um, you need modulators. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we found is that by shrinking the size of these modulators and coming up with novel vertical PN junctions, we could drive the energy required uh, way, way down. Um, this is, uh, I think, the lowest power, highest speed modulator that's been demonstrated so far. Uh, it's working at about, uh, what, 85 femtojoules, um, and, it, and it works at CMOS compatible voltages. Um, it turns out you can use several of these. This is a second order filter that, again, is electrically controllable. Um, <clears throat> and I think this is the first demonstration of a silicon uh, bandpass switch, certainly at this scale. Um, <clears throat> you can, uh, if you make them very small, let's see. Uh, if you make them very small, the free spectral range is very large, and you can stack up lots of different wavelength channels in this free spectral range and make quite an uh, enormous bandwidth uh, switching network in a very, very small area. So you could put 64 channels on a reasonable spacing. Each channel switching 10 gigabits per second, you start to get these uh, many, many terabits in the size of a bond pad in a conventional uh, electrical chip. And these, uh, these numbers are really quite, uh, quite impressive, a low drive voltage, this sort of uh, power penalty for, for those of you that are familiar with uh, telecom switching is, uh, is quite competitive. And it's made out of silicon, which is always a plus. A um, couple of other programs, it turns out when you shrink things down extremely small, the thermal optic effect, especially in silicon, uh, is also relatively low power and happens quite quickly. So we have a project that's looking at building thermal phase shifters <coughs> that have uh, microsecond sort of response time, so several orders of magnitude faster than uh, conventional ones, and that take uh, very reasonable amounts of power. Uh, so this is quite competitive for, for doing phase modulators or very large dynamic range uh, filter tuning and that kind of thing. You can apply a lot of these effects uh, to a collaboration that we have with Franz Kartner where we're taking, uh, he's got an experiment that's locking a microwave oscillator to a femtosecond laser, and uh, we think we can integrate that. One last thing uh, is, uh, is turning a bug into a feature. Uh, these microring resonators, it turns out, are uh, very temperature sensitive. They're very high Q, you, uh, you change the temperature and the Refractive index change with temperature in uh, silicon nitride or silicon is fairly sharp. So these interconnect approaches need to be temperature stabilized or otherwise athermalized. If you exacerbate that problem by sticking it on a pedestal of, of oxide or something else that's highly insulating, you can actually get quite a good temperature sensor. And this is what a bolometer is, essentially. So if you do the math, it, it actually looks like this approach can come very, very close to the performance of cooled Mercad Telluride, which is sort of the gold standard for infrared uh, photo detection. Uh, and it's uncooled, and it's made out of silicon again. Um, so uh, we've demonstrated performance exceeding the best uh, bolometers, uh, uncooled bolometers now, and are pushing, trying to push the detector performance down to this theoretical limit. Uh, if you use conventional scanned wavelength WDM techniques, uh, you can imagine scaling this to uh, large arrays of pixels, which uh, might also be of interest uh, because it's made of silicon instead of Mercad Telluride, which uh, is sort of the, uh, the worst possible material that you could, you could love. Um, and it has to be bump bonded and things. So that's an interesting project. Uh, that's just uh, uh, a nice summary. And let me close with this. Uh, hopefully you got a little better feel for the breadth of things going on at Sandia. Um, we apply a lot of scientists, or we employ a lot of scientists and engineers, and uh, we're, we're always looking for more. Um, a lot of positions require citizenship. Um, right now we are under a hiring pause although uh, I can still hire postdocs. Um, 
But, uh, but please, uh, if you have any questions or you have an interest, uh, contact me. Thanks. So we have time for one question. <laughs> and then you can with Rick. Sure. So we'll throw for the only question. So uh, the 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 Mercad telluride is a direct de detector. It's uh, compositionally graded to get the band gap at the appropriate place. So it's uh, it's grown with MOCVD, I think. Um, not a trivial process. Uh, had probably a billion dollars or more invested in it. Uh, so it's a fairly mature process. The growing the detectors is part of the issue. The other issue is that uh, this has to be bump bonded onto a readout integrated circuit, a ROIC. Um, and uh, the largest, uh, so Sandia commissioned the largest uh, infrared focal plane that's been demonstrated so far, I think, that's uh, 4K by 4K. And uh, apparently, I, was, I wasn't involved in that, but apparently that was a very painful development process, costing tens of millions of dollars. Uh, simply to get the uh, enough material so that you don't have a lot of dropouts and all the bump bonds and interactions apparently with the ROICs. Uh, it's, you know, it's a mature process, uh, but it's, it's not a trivial process. Um, and one of the things I've noticed with the, with the silicon photonics and the, our silicon phononics, silicon's a great material system to work in because uh, you know what, in the last 30 years there's probably been $200 billion spent on learning the materials and optimizing the tools and optimizing the process and uh, training all of these people to be uh, incredibly anal retentive <laughs> in terms of uh, 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 in terms of optimizing processes. So it's great when we're making this stuff because you know, designs don't always work. Uh, and then you have a question of, was it the fabrication error? Was it a design error? And uh, a lot of times, you have people pointing the fingers. In a silicon fab, that doesn't happen too often because they take incredible metrology at every step. And so you can go back in and say, well, there were SEMs taken at this layer deposition. You know, you know we made a small mistake. Uh, so the design uh, feedback loop closes very quickly and things mature. So uh, personally, I think if you want a 100 megapixel array in the infrared, I don't know that you'll get there with uh, Merkhead Telluride. Um, but it would be, uh, you know, uh, a fraction of a wafer. And people make, you know, full wafers with extremely high yields in silicon. So to me, that's, uh, that's a pretty powerful... Uh, Inducement. So, let's thanks, Rick, and thank you, everybody. Thank you.